welcome, welcome to Last Waff Tonight. I'll be your host, Wolfgang Doghouse, and no, I won't be covering the previous week. I just like John Oliver a lot. Need some cheese in my crumpet, you dainty British field mouse. Put the shag in my carpet, you delectable morsel of a man. Moving on. Our main topic tonight concerns coyotes. Coyotes, the furry fandom's trashy Dorito. Think stale Cool Ranch, found under couch cushions. Now you might ask me, Wolfgang, why are you covering coyotes for your very first episode? Shouldn't it be about wolves instead? And that's fair. I mean, coyotes are basically just knockoff wish.com wolves after all. The thing is, despite the coyote being among the top 20 most popular species a person may identify as within the furry fandom, and with a very long history of spiritual and superstitious beliefs throughout society and culture, most of us actually don't know a whole lot about them. But it's our lack of understanding that has caused a myriad of problems in our world, and unfortunately, nature often ends up taking the brunt of those mistakes. Of course, this is nothing new, but over the past few decades, it's become increasingly impossible to ignore our negative impact on nature due to the choices we've made. It physically and financially harms us, and it deprives us of experiencing a more diverse ecosystem and balanced environment. For the most part, I believe that humans are inquisitive creatures. We like to learn about the world and those who share it with us. I want to help everyone understand how important the coyote is, not just to us in his territory, but also the rest of the environment. Most especially, I want us to understand that all creatures, including us, are individuals, and each individual has value, and sometimes they have the power to make incredible changes in the world that we share. But I'm excited to tell you about a lot of the recent news concerning coyotes. Over the last few years, there have been an increasing number of bills about them proposed to state legislatures. The two issues being discussed are whether to enact a permanent ban on coyote killing contest, as well as the ability to place lethal traps on public land. Now currently, eight states have banned coyote killing contests and the use of leg hold and various other traps on public land. Now you may hear this and say, hey, that's pretty awesome, and you'd be totally right for saying that but most people probably didn't even know that these practices exist to begin with. You really can't talk about coyotes in the environment without also talking about wolves, though, because wolves regulate coyote populations. But while these recent moves involving coyotes should open up the door for further conversations on predator management in general, leave it to Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming to do the exact opposite of what science suggests on how to manage the predator populations in their states. These three states have a very long history of staunch opposition to wolves as well as other predators, and have even resorted to illegally removing endangered species protections without federal approval, as seen in 2009 when wolves were removed from the ESA. But that's a rather long and complicated topic, so we won't have time to cover it today. The next episode will address this in detail, so I hope you will all tune in for that discussion at that time. But in any case... There is so much reason to be excited about these bans on coyote hunting contests and trapping on public lands. Beyond the obvious, there is so much more for what this means for the future of how we see the environment and the sciences that we adopt based on these observations. I'll be breaking this down into several segments, and we'll talk about related issues in future episodes, but tonight, we're going to be focusing on the effect of coyote hunting and why these bills are being passed in our legislatures. But to understand all this, we also need to discuss coyote pack structures, their role in the environment, and what happens when pack members are removed. We'll also talk about what to do when you see a coyote, and why, if any species deserves to be called stinky, it's coyotes, not wolves. As a matter of fact, that is why we call them trash. You know who else smells bad? Red foxes. Wow. They smell like skunk spray. But hey, Skunk spray can smell like good weed, and maybe that's why we like to roll around in it every once in a while. Or on foxes. Also, cats smell like sour spit at best. The point is, wolves generally smell like pine needles and freedom when we don't want to smell like good weed and share it with our buddies, and coyotes, they just smell like It's not my fault your boopers are broken. Moving on. Coyote pack structures. The first thing you need to know about coyote packs is that they are family units consisting of a breeding pair, their offspring, cousins, and offensive uncles the rest of the pack tries to ignore. You know the type. 
Contrary to what we all might expect, coyotes are monogamous life mates. I know, right? You'd think they'd be the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, or sir type, but they're actually quite devoted with only a few instances of fornication. Usually this only happens when there's a huge abundance of other coyotes around. <laughs> now, what's important to note here is that while both wolves and coyotes are monogamous life mates, they still have to find a replacement if something tragic were to happen to their mate. This could certainly lead to many issues, especially when the breeding pairs are constantly changing. The stability and overall experience level of the pack is dramatically decreased, and a lack of experience inevitably creates more mistakes which will often be the kind they won't survive. I'll get more into this later. As for some quick and relevant facts for you, there are 19 subspecies of coyotes. A pack's territory typically ranges from 4 to 15 square miles much smaller than wolf territory, which can range anywhere from 13 to 2,400 square miles. You might note the huge gap for wolf territory, but we'll discuss that in the next episode. Coyotes operate a bit differently from wolves. While wolf packs are generally together at all times, coyotes split up during the day and each take a portion of their territory to scavenge on. At night, they often hunt as a pack. The first coyote howl you may hear at night is often the mom calling in her pups to hunt together. Speaking of food, coyotes will eat damn near anything. They're like canid billy goats, eating whatever they can find, especially if they're very hungry. But today, we have both rural and urban coyotes, and their diets are a bit different. Both are very opportunistic creatures, but a rural coyote's diet mostly consists of rodents, rabbits, frogs, fruit, gay frogs, and even fish and insects. What? Alright. Yeah, my mistake. I'm being told that coyotes are not aware of a frog's sexual orientation. Which brings to question, how is Alex Jones? Huh. Anyways, urban coyotes will still eat those same critters, but often end up eating pet food people have left out, and sometimes even the pet. Which I should add, don't ever leave your pet unattended in areas where there's been coyote activity. Urban coyotes are also notorious for hanging around dumpsters and getting into our trash. Exhibit A. I just want to be clear, this is a crime. Animal art crimes. This is vandalism. It's good vandalism, though. They also keep the environment clean of carrion, which basically means they eat random dead things. So there you have it. They truly are what they eat. Trash. Albeit, lovable trash. And did you know that some would believe that when coyotes get in the habit of eating our junk food, they can become aggressive? Fusa bacteria in the gut are linked to protein-rich diets and lower aggression in dogs. But an urban coyote who killed a large domestic dog was found to have no Fusa bacteria in its gut at all. Now, correlation isn't necessarily causation, but it would be best to keep them out of our trash and stop letting them eat our junk food either way. It would certainly explain why Flair is so growly. He's always so growly. At least to get for the tacos so he doesn't have to eat your cat, though. That's good. Coyotes are important for regulating the number of mesocarnivores such as foxes, raccoons, skunks, and yes, feral cats, which in turn increases the amount of birds and overall biodiversity of the region. And hey, did you know that it's illegal to have your pet off leash in most cities and suburbs? That includes cats. Please don't let your cat wander the neighborhood. It's horrible for the environment, and exposes them to dangers that could otherwise have been easily averted. Like wolves, coyotes' mating season ranges from January to March, and pups are born about two months later. The size of a litter of coyote pups is reflected in the abundance of available resources, territory, and need. Remember that last bit, because we'll come back to it later. So now that we've covered some of the basics, let's talk about coyote hunting, coyote hunting contest, and why laws are being passed in legislatures around the nation that effectively ban them. Putting emotions and morality aside, and these contests are immoral on so many levels. These bills are being debated and passed based on the facts that support how coyote hunting negatively impacts the environment, wastes taxpayer spending, and compounds the problems that coyotes allegedly cause. It may be true that coyotes can sometimes cause problems along with mischief and mayhem, but if we want to decrease these problems, we have to change the way that we interact with them. That is to say, 
not persecuting and killing them in the literal hundreds of thousands every year. It's estimated that at least 400,000 coyotes are killed every year in the United States, making them the most heavily persecuted animal today. Over 80,000 coyotes were killed in 2020 by government agencies, and 62,000 of those were executed directly by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Yes, I said the Department of Agriculture. You know, ranchers. That's basically like having Volkswagen set our nation's emission standards or putting Nestle in charge of our water supply. Which, by the way, they kind of do. You might have tilted your head when I mentioned tax dollars. But did you know that we spend over $20 million a year for wildlife services to hunt coyotes from a helicopter with hired snipers, as well as other means that could include trapping and the use of poisons known as predicides? If you're a rancher, you could contact the USDA's wildlife services, and they would fly a helicopter to kill coyotes in your area on everyone's tax dollars. One sniper may kill over 100 individuals in a day. What about the remaining coyote deaths? You know, around 320,000 of them. Those coyotes are killed largely by coyote hunting contests, which, as I've mentioned before, are becoming increasingly illegal in recent years. This is due to the actions and research of dedicated wildlife biologists and environmental groups who have been pushing these bills into our legislatures and demanding that we update the science concerning predator control which is mostly based on very biased data from the 1970s and 80s. Yes, you heard me correctly. That's 40 and 50 year old research there. The reasoning behind that is a rather long conversation, so I intend to discuss that further in another episode in the near future. All of this stuff is connected, but tonight we're just trying to focus on coyotes. Before I move on, I'd like to inform you of a rather startling fact. Unless you're a sociopath, all of us can agree that torturing other animals in any way is not acceptable. We have laws that enforce this. It's illegal to purposely harm your pet, and it's illegal to cause a deer, hog, and pretty much all other wild creatures to needlessly suffer. That is, of course, if they're not labeled as a pest. Coyotes are labeled as pests, and they have no rights and no protections in that regard whatsoever. People can and do torture and kill them for fun and they get away with it because of that label. Pretty much the only law regarding coyotes is that you can't leave their carcasses on public lands. But it's perfectly legal to chase them down to exhaustion and run them over with a snowmobile or pour gasolines into their denso. Now I'm not going to show you a bunch of disturbing images confirming that fact, but it's not hard to find through the thousands of videos out there of people relishing in the suffering of coyotes. It's easy to find but it is really hard to watch. Probably the most effective and prevalent science that illustrates why we shouldn't be killing coyotes is rather easy to understand. As I mentioned earlier, coyote packs are family units where only the breeding pairs are allowed to mate. But if one member of the breeding pair is killed, the pack breaks up and each member begins to look for a mate. This can be illustrated here. Research shows that when coyotes are lethally controlled, they rebound, with quicker regeneration in their population numbers. Wolves are not nearly as capable of doing this, and that's why we have far fewer wolves and many more coyotes existing today as opposed to 500 years ago, well before any kind of extermination efforts. Coyotes, too, were purposely targeted for their complete elimination and extinction, not just wolves. The disruption of a coyote's family group structure leads to an increase in the number of females breeding in the population, and the increase in available resources leads to earlier breeding ages, larger litter sizes, and higher survival rates among pups. This allows coyote populations to bounce back very quickly, even when as much as 70 or 80 percent of their numbers are removed through lethal control efforts. Now you're not going to hear me complaining about coyote pups surviving and being well fed, But if they say they have a problem with coyote populations, they should really stop shooting them. Like most immediately, and most indefinitely. Yeah. But it's because of this that lethal programs are not effective at reducing coyote populations. And non-selective coyote trapping programs are not effective at solving conflicts. In addition, 
Coyotes removed from an area will quickly be replaced by transient coyotes looking for vacant home range. A transient coyote being a coyote belonging to a pack which was likely disrupted by lethal means and who now is a survivor is looking to make a new family and occupy territory which has now been made available because the coyotes who occupied it before them were killed as well, likely on the same day. So if the root causes of human-coyote conflicts have not been addressed, incoming coyotes may quickly become nuisance coyotes as well. It's far better to have well-behaved resident coyotes who will hold their territories and keep transients at bay than have to risk dealing with newcomers who don't know the rules, so to speak. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand how this works. But try telling Bubba, whose daddy's daddy's daddy has been doing it their way for generations. Coincidentally, his daddy's daddy's daddy is likely largely responsible for the problems Bubba experiences today. The dead can't learn, and all that the mass killing of coyotes has done it's created an environment where most wild coyotes are young and inexperienced. They will continue to create more problems and hook up to make more little troublemakers at younger ages. We don't want a bunch of yoke pups causing trouble, and we certainly shouldn't want to see them killed due to their ignorance of the expectations humans place on them either. It is far more beneficial to everyone to allow them to live longer lives and teach them how to behave along the way. Teach them, and they will teach their pups. As for trapping on public lands, it really doesn't require much debate to understand why this is becoming so increasingly illegal. More than 85 countries have completely banned or heavily restricted steel jaw leg hold traps. The USA is not one of them. Simply put, traps are indiscriminate and cruel. But if you get to talking about traps, you're likely going to hear something about Roxy's Law. Roxy was a dog who, while hiking in New Mexico with her owner, was lured into a snare trap. Her owner was right in front of her, but when they heard Roxy make a strange noise, they weren't able to free her before she was strangled to death. Now the incident serves as an argument as to why these traps are so dangerous, even when your pets are kept close at your side. But Roxy is far from the first or the last to die by traps intended for coyotes and other wild predators. It's estimated that over a million non-target animals are caught in traps placed on public lands every year. It could be your dog, a feral or wild cat, or even raptors and deer. Endangered and protected animals often end up in them as well. There's little more American than planting a cyanide trap, killing a bald eagle and saying, oops, and plan in a few hundred thousand more in the following years, right under the noses of all of your citizens. It's also not uncommon for trappers to purposely target protected animals as a means to get around those protections. If a trapped animal is currently under protected status, they may not be able to sell the pelt, but I can assure you, they're not bothered by that. When concerning coyotes and wolves, it's quite likely that they just hate them and view them as vermin. On many occasions, people are injured in traps as well. The most common cause of humans being hurt by traps is when trying to release a non-target animal, often someone's pet, from a trap they were lured into. This is such a common problem, some areas offer instructional courses on what to do in the case of your pet getting caught in a trap. Which I mean, this is good to know when, thank you, but wow. Can we just not plant traps? Please? Maybe? Unfortunately, the pets who survive leg hold traps and snares often require amputation due to the severity of their injuries, and other non-target animals are usually dispatched. If they're lucky, maybe they'll be taken to a rescue where they can heal and be reintroduced back into the environment, but while these touching success stories are so wonderful to see and hear, they make a very small margin of the animals who fall victim to these cruel devices. Even the few who are rescued may never be able to be reintroduced back into the wild and resume the life they once had. There is very little regulation to trapping, and trappers rarely leave identification for a variety of reasons, mostly laziness, but as an added perk, to attempt to avoid the penalty of an accident being traced back to them should their trap cause a protected animal to perish or cause harm to a human. 
Traps are seldom marked to warn people that they are in the area, and they can even be placed just 25 feet from a county road in most states. In a few instances, children have been seriously hurt as well. In 2018, a boy in Idaho almost died when he and his dog accidentally triggered an M44 cyanide trap. The dog perished, and the boy is still experiencing difficulties today. The USDA, who planted the trap, denies all responsibility and instead blames the 14-year-old boy. Yeah, get that. Now, M44s look like a little sprinkler head and can be planted anywhere in the soil. The cap is wrapped in cloth and covered with a lure, so that when an animal bites down and tugs at it, it pops and sprays concentrated cyanide and a dense orange powder. Animals who trigger this device usually die within minutes. These traps are widely used across the nation and can even be planted in close proximity to family housing and neighborhoods. In the case of the boy in Idaho, 13 houses can be clearly seen from where that device was planted. One of every good dog owner's greatest fears is that of their beloved pet getting out and running off. They take extra precautions to help prevent this from ever happening, but you can really only do so much and accidents happen. Now compound that fear with the fact there could be a cyanide trap within earshot of your home, and you may never even know about it. The thought's truly terrifying, and it's all done with a governing state's approval. So look, coyotes don't recognize humans as an authority figure very well. That's not entirely their fault, though, since humans routinely give them mixed messages. The ones they don't shoot, that is. They do recognize wolves as the beautiful, majestic, benevolent, stoic, and notably modest and humble creatures of perfection that we clearly are. And as such, they recognize our authority. Hmm. Anyways, if you want less problems with coyotes, you want wolves around to help you out. We can keep them in check in the wilderness, and humans can keep them out of their cities. But we'll discuss wolves and their relations with coyotes in the next episode. Now let's wrap this up and talk about what you can do to help. First and foremost, you should write your state representatives and look up any organizations in your area that help coyotes and push these bills into our legislatures. One that I enjoy a whole lot is Project Coyote. They will also be our sponsor charity for this episode, and I'll leave a link in the description for you all to donate to. But what should you do if you see a coyote? While this might seem like a silly question, after all, isn't running into wild carnivores the sort of thing one usually goes into the wilderness to do? Especially femboy foxes? <clears throat> well, that isn't quite so with coyotes, especially with their traditional habitats becoming so scarce. When handling an encounter with a coyote, it's important to remember that coyotes are both smart and wise. I mean, not as smart or wise as wolves, but eh. They're all right. Unless they're ill, a coyote won't attack at random and on sight. A coyote that keeps its distance and stalks you is likely just a concerned parent escorting you through their territory. By conspicuously stalking you, they're sending a message saying, hey, my family lives here, so get off my property. In this case, just keep your eye on them and don't linger. Once you're out of their space, they'll go about their business. Coyote business. During pupping season, they'll be especially concerned for the safety of their pups. It's important not to disregard their message and go deeper into their territory. Sometimes ignoring isn't the right approach, though. If they're getting too close or they're in your own territory, like your home, raiding your refrigerator, sleeping on your couch, leaving their stuff all over the place. Jacksonillion! <laughs> Well, then it's time to start hazing. No, not like on the bus to school. Hazing means discouraging them from doing something or being somewhere they shouldn't be. The simplest approach is to get big and round. I mean loud. Big and loud. Yeah. Act intimidating and tell them to beat it. Stomp the ground. Yell at them. You can even toss sticks in their direction. Be extra alert if you're walking a pet. Coyotes consider dogs and cats to be both a competition for resources and a threat to their family and territory. Never walk your dog off leash in an area that's home to coyotes. Coyotes may try to approach your dog from behind and nip at their heels as a warning. 
They're very sneaky, and they may have more than one family member on guard duty, so keep your eyes peeled and haze them if they start to approach. Finally, it's usually best to leave any coyote pups alone should you find them. When the family moves to a new den, they can only take so many pups with them at a time. It's quite likely that a pup which appears to be abandoned is actually just waiting for his or her turn. It might not feel right, but the best thing you can do is just leave the area immediately and give the parent time to come back and fetch them. I expect some of you might have been thinking about the act of relocating coyotes as an alternative to killing them during this discussion, and maybe the city you live in has done this in the past. While I appreciate the sentiment, I mean, it's good that you're thinking about non-lethal alternatives, but it's not nearly as nice of a solution as you might think. Relocating coyotes is basically a death sentence because coyotes have a very strong sense of home. They're going to want to return to their territory no matter the distance. It's like a screwed up version of Disney's Homeward Bound, where Shadow dies in a trap while scavenging for food, Chance is shot by a human for trying to eat their chickens, and Sassy gets her tail eaten off by a moose. <laughs> I'm just kidding on the last one. She pushes herself into starvation because she can't raid the dumpster behind Taco Bell anymore and eventually gets hit by a car. Mm hmm. Seriously, worst version ever. As much as I wish it were so, there's no quick fix to the problems we've created with coyotes. It's going to require people to be aware of all of these things and to know how to handle coyotes when they encounter them. That's what activism is all about, though. The goal is to educate others about an important topic that often brings to light suffering in a population. If the activist succeeds in reaching a person or group of persons, they too will be motivated to do the same, and that would make them the activist as well. But don't forget, and I cannot stress this enough, do not forget to take the next step and demand that the state and federal government recognize and protect those individuals who are suffering. With awareness, everyone should care. If they don't care, they're simply only concerned with serving themselves and their own interest. They will make weak and narrow-minded justifications for their actions or inactions and refuse to take any accountability for the problems they create. We're better than that, and I hope that you will all be an activist too. Spread awareness. Make donations to charities that support the victims of suffering. Write your state and federal representatives and vote. Speaking of all that, I encourage you all to make a donation to Project Coyote and contact your state representatives to demand a permanent ban on coyote killing contest and trapping on public lands. And guess what? When you donate just $25 or more to Project Coyote, you can get this adorable coyote face mask. Look at this thing. That's a quality face mask. I mean, you're putting a trash dog over your face to protect yourself and others from a trash virus, but don't worry about it. This is coyote logic. It's not supposed to make sense. But that's high quality trash right there, which is why I have one myself. But in case you don't want trash on your face, they have other awesome designs to choose from, like foxes that smell like weed and brilliantly flawless wolves. Mm -hmm. Well, that's our show. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. And now is a nice little treat Please enjoy a bunch of amazing Coyote Suitor picks and gifts provided by the outstanding people who all volunteered to contribute to this episode, played out to a song by Soaring Love Seat entitled Coyote. All the media presented in this episode has been used with the permission of its creators and will be credited in the description below this video. Thanks again and have a great night! <laughs> Don't roll in that coyote, you've got better things to do than spend all your time eating trash. You could be out coyote, howling at the moon, not chasing some old lady's wayward cat. Coyote, coyote, what have you become? From native god to foiled cartoon cliché. Coyote, coyote, you know there are some who will believe you're still a god.